Studio One was the great uh, television drama of its time, won all kinds of awards, out of New York, all New York actors. I was in New York. Uh, the best people uh, in New York wanted to be on those shows, and uh, I wanted to be on those shows, and and uh, I was I was there with some frequency. My initial view of television was that it was exciting, an adventure, a voyage of discovery. It didn't occur to me that it would not be successful because there was so much money behind it and so many, you know, if RCA was behind it and, and, and the various other um, people in the television business, I know people say they thought it was just going to be a fad. I think that's what Don Hewitt has said. Maloney. For one, enjoyed immensely my period on the stage. But television was another thing, and uh, a new adventure. And it was remarkable uh, to run, you know, there was no stopping the camera. In the beginning, the very beginning, like Worthington Minor was at CBS, and Fred Coe was at NBC. And they had two ideas of how television should be done. One was subjective at CBS, and objective at NBC, is that the, at CBS, the camera would move around and find the story. But over at NBC, we would do the story and the camera would be there and follow the story that way instead of an inquiring camera. And uh, it was a different style. Tony Minor produced Studio One was the, and Martin Manulis too, were the great dramatic heads at CBS. See, drama was uh, a, a real staple. Uh, for television uh, in the in live drama. But we once had uh, on the three networks 14 live dramas on the air, uh, all hours. T till, you, till you had tape, some of the greatest things were done on live television. You know, Studio One, all these great drama shows. When you stop to think of how they had to rehearse and how the camera, you couldn't turn back, it was done on the air. And they were fabulous, just fabulous. And there, there was a spontaneity that you cannot, you cannot uh, manufacture. So I call it the golden age, because it was. And I also say that the, it was a, a, a decade of opportunity. Never, to my knowledge, at any point in the history of this country was there such a chance for talent. As I said, if you could write you couldn't help but get discovered. Hanging on was another matter, but you could get discovered. Same with actors. It used hundreds of actors every week. Never anywhere at any time was there so much work for creative people. And that's pretty golden. I always say there was gold dust in the air. Studio One, I worked with uh, Hume Cronin and his wonderful wife. Oh, what a gorgeous actress she was. Heartbreak House, we did. Tony Minor was the producer, a real producer, live television. How did we live through live television? Do you know how we did that? I don't know to this day, because we would do a scene, I was in it, fade out. Count to five, fade in on the other side of the studio, and I'm in that scene too, in a different jacket and tie. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. We were so into the work, you see, that we did it. But it was terrifying. Studio One had a kind of formal rigidity. Uh, it seemed, I guess because it was the first successful dramatic anthology show, it was like Theater Guild of the Air, uh, used to in radio days have this, or, uh, or Lux Radio Playhouse had these special, Studio Aura had a little bit of that, uh, Studio One had a little bit of that quality, maybe because of Worthington Minor, who was the exec producer on it. I was very, very fond of uh, Tony Minor. He was, well, he was the producer, really, of Studio One, among other shows and series that he had, but that was the most famous. 
and uh, they shot everything in uh, Grand Central Station in those days. And Channel 5, Dumont, also was shooting there. In those days, you have to remember that, that with uh, as primitive as it was, and uh, with as prohibitive as costs were, that very often the sets were just canvas. They didn't look real at all, but there they were. Gee, that's such a beautiful moon, even if it isn't quite real. Hey, it's full, too. Like a June moon. It's not June, it's October. Yeah, I know, but they sort of go together. I'm always thinking of words that rhyme, even when I ain't working. And there would be one set here, a canvas wall, and another set back of it, right against it, for another show that was on the other side. And the minute you finish your show, you'd be, have to be very quiet and tiptoe because they were on the air now on the other side of this flat. And of course you could hear a pin drop. But uh, I did studio, a number of studio ones uh, uh, for Tony Minor. He was, a, he was a lovely man. He was like, like the invisible uh, father figure. When I was doing Studio One, uh, it was one of my very first shows. I was always told what Tony wanted and what he didn't want. Well, I think that he had a wonderful literary mind, and uh, as well as a good theatrical mind. He, he knew what was good material for television. Whatever television was at that point, it never occurred to me. Uh, I would just read a script and look at the part and say, yeah, boy, that's got a lot of lines. That's a good part. Uh, I was not anywhere near as discerning, uh, hopefully, as I became. Um, I would play good parts and bad parts, but we all did. The main thing was to work and be seen. Ah, boy, it sure is great to be here, you know. It's a wonderful town. Gee, as soon as I get settled, I want to take me a ferry boat over to Staten's Island and back. That's an island you have to take a ferry boat to get there? Oh, you must have been there, though. Oh, sure. I go there all the time, just for the trip. Oh. Oh, I want to see the goddess of liberty, too. The statue, I mean. You know that they tell me that costs a million and a half dollars, and it weighs 250 tons. She ought to cut out sweets. You can really play the piano. But a live show had three cameras, and they were huge. They were pretty big. And two booms, and they weren't people holding a microphone. These were the, the big dollies that were so. So you figured there were these three cameras and two booms, all connected by cables. The camera was very large, had a lot of hot tubes in it, and they had a fan in it. And the fan was as as um, low noise, as minimal noise as possible. So it made a little whirring sound as it cooled the innards of the of the camera. For all, the, for, for all that you might know, it was breathing. And there was this warm camera. And there was somebody behind it, but he was kind of hidden behind this massive thing. So the thing kind of moved. In fact, one time, I saw two cameras on dollies, electrical dollies, from one end of the, somehow they got loose. And they came at each other. Two, two cameras on electrical dollies, like two prehistoric animals. Mm, boom! And they hit each other, and they fell over like two prehistoric amphibians. So I thought of the camera as alive. It was like if you stood beside it to make an entrance, the thing kind of purred at you. If you were going to come on camera during a live television show, you might make an entrance beside the camera. Q comes on, you come past the camera. So while you're standing by the camera, the thing is going... And it never frightened me. It, I always loved that camera. I loved the little camera. Because the camera could tell you where to look. The camera would move into a face and you knew what you were supposed to. The camera could move into a tabletop and you knew you were supposed to look at the poison falling into the ashtray. It just freed the cameras to, to tell the story, to help tell the story. Oh, Ben, here's something for you. Oh, thank you. Can Yes, Where did this come from? It was lying there on the hall table. No, someone must have brought it. Someone must have. 
And the function of a designer actually was to take that script and break it down and try to figure out a flow chart where the actors would be from this set to this set. And the best way to get them and get the directors, to, to allow the director a choice of, of cameras so that they weren't hitting each other, they weren't, the worst thing of all would be to cross a cable because they couldn't do it. You couldn't jump over a cable. You know, you had to hit marks. You had to be saying something in the extreme naturalness of a close-up and walk 10 yards and stand on a mark with your toes on the mark because the focus was, was preset. Uh, the, the, the focus puller was the cameraman and he knew where you were going to be and if you weren't there you were out of focus. And if you were out of focus then you couldn't cut. I, I was almost blew it because I, I thought the next scene was a scene in the office, so there I was, I'm sitting up in the office with my sumo waiting for the cameras because the cameras have to reposition. And then I see all of a sudden, I see all of the cameras focusing all the way down the end of the studio on the bed scene. And then, oh my God, I realized that that's where I'm supposed to be. And I ran down and, and ran down and, 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 and got under the cover, still dressed, got under the cover and pulled the cover up, up over here over my head so that you couldn't see that I had all the shirt and tie and so on and did the scene like that in the bed and when I got up I got up with the blanket up around me like this because this is live and I'd never had to memorize that much in my life also it was live and if you blew it you blew it from coast to coast that that really shocked you when you saw that little needle going up to the hour you said, now I'm on and you wouldn't breathe properly for another hour. It was scary. They um, tell some great stories about what happened on, on live dramas, and they're all true because they couldn't cut, they couldn't cut away, it just went. You didn't have time to be nerve-wracked. You literally did not have time to be nerve-wracked. And then another thing we shot on location, I can remember when I did a studio one, which was one of the best parts I ever had, was we shot down uh, in a studio over Grand Central Station. Uh, and so many things could go wrong, you know, and did. But if you were a Broadway actor, you had training, you had background. Do you ever know Bob Preston, Robert Preston, the music man? Great guy and good actor. I remember walking into his dressing room and seeing a, on his mirror a big sign saying, security is knowing the words. True, to a large extent. Or it sure helps you. You got enough and what's unforeseen may happen and the audience and elements, live elements when you're on the stage that you better not have to fish for the words. Nobody knew they were mistakes. Only we knew they were mistakes. The audience, no, we were too good. By this time, we were too good. We were doing live television. None of us knew. We were all, we were all new together. There were no experts. There was nobody there to tell us what we did years ago so that we all either made mistakes and, and, and believe me, there were a lot of shows where the camera would bang into the scenery and, and uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of wild things happening. But no, none of us really knew. We all learned together. I had all these templates to show angles and sizes of cameras and stuff like that. And it was cramped. It was really cramped. The studios... I don't remember, but, but if it were 100 feet, it would be, it's a lot. And, and they were only 12 feet high. 12 feet above you were the, were the lights. Well, as an actor, what was the most important thing that you had to remember before the, the, the broadcast? Not to shake. Because <laughs> it was a scary experience. Uh, just the terror of that li of that live camera. It, it was very, very tough. It really was. And my heart 
went out to an awful lot of people who couldn't remember their lines. Well, how was the atmosphere before, before you and Ray went on? Immensely tense. Because, it, you know, you were at the mercy of, uh, of the elements that, that a television show encompasses. And that was very, very difficult. Technically, it's always been difficult, television has. It, I think it's the most difficult of all, of all the medium. Hey, I don't have to marry her anymore. Oh, Fred, I'm Eddie. so happy. Only, gee, I still got the tickets. It says Frederick M. Stevens in white. I wonder if those steamship lines allow you to change your wife. Sure, if you don't do it in midstream. Uh, why? Do those big boats go very fast? Oh, they go awful fast. What you want is a freighter that goes real slow. Well, they all had quality. All the, all the things that, that brought the Patty Chayefskys and, uh, and some of the writers to television had quality. And that quality was a, a great treat for a, a starved, hungry audience that, had, that was looking for something new and exciting and different. And television was that. And it wasn't just people standing there and getting shots, you know, it was the, the fluidity of the camera, the, uh, the uh, incredible talents of the technicians and of the actors as well. To, to do a job like that in, in a comparatively short time with so many hazards, it, uh, it was tricky. A golden age is a flowering, plain and simple historically Artistically, it is a flowering. It is not a zenith. It has never been considered a zenith. It is a flowering. And that is what television was doing in the 50s. It was flowering. They say, we've got a new golden age. Well, you can't have another golden age. You only get one, because you only flower. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's a, not a, uh, an, an annual, or whatever you call a flower, that's going to come up every year. It was the immediacy of it, the, that wonderful immediacy of the live. There was something terribly personal about everything that was done. Everybody took a personal interest in it. The golden age, is, for me, is what we are talking about. The plays, and Sid Caesar, and Ed Sullivan, and Martha Ray, and Red Skelton, and Patty Chayefsky. And that is what, to me, is the golden age of television. The people who went out live and faced the audiences of 50 million people and did it. And that took guts. It really did. And they did it mostly without complaining. <laughs> you know? They were frantic and hectic and uh, impossible and, and just kind of glorious. And I wouldn't have missed it. <laughs>